When Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, asked the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, how much he loved her, he replied, like a firmly tied knot, symbolizing the strength and permanence of his love. Despite this deep bond, slanders arose against her. During that episode, some tried to discredit the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and Islam by questioning his marriage to Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, due to her youth at the time. The polytheists of Mecca offered the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, power, wealth, and the most beautiful women if he would abandon his mission of conveying the message of Allah. He responded firmly, even if they offered me the sun in one hand and the moon in the other, I would not abandon my mission, rejecting all material temptations. Despite his great nobility and beauty, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, did not marry until he was 25 years old, when he married Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her, a 40-year-old widow. Those who accuse his marriage to Aisha of being motivated by earthly desires do not understand the true nature of his character. Observing the marriages of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, it is evident that most of his wives were older women, widows, and sometimes mothers. Unions that were not motivated by personal desires, but by higher spiritual reasons. Accusing someone of such great purity and integrity is not only an injustice, but also goes against the fundamental principles of humanity. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, were married two years after their initial engagement. If the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, had questionable intentions, he could have married numerous young women without any opposition. The hypocrites of the time, such as Abdullah ibn Salul, took every opportunity to slander the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his family, creating slanders over trivial matters. However, they never dared to criticize or question Aisha's marriage or her age, which is sufficient evidence that there was nothing reproachable. If there had been any reason to question this, the hypocrites would have used it to discredit the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. The companions of the Prophet would never have remained silent if they had seen anything wrong. Until recently, this topic was not controversial among Muslims because there was nothing to defend. Muslims accept with full confidence what Allah glorified and exalted be He has decreed. Our faith in the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him, remains firm and unshakable. It is crucial to present the facts clearly for future investigations. I recommend reading the book by Imam Shibli, The Golden Age of Islam. For more details, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was engaged to another man before her union with the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. This is further evidence that the norms and customs of that time were different. Some who do not believe in Allah, glorified and exalted be He, have accused the Prophet of marrying Aisha when she was a six-year-old girl. These accusations are not only unfounded but also outrageous, especially for those with a basic knowledge of the biography of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Often, the best response to such slanders is silence, as it is said that ignorance is best met with no response. However, responding to these lies is necessary to avoid confusion and to strengthen the faith of our brothers and sisters who seek answers from our authorities. Let us examine this issue together, using historical evidence to refute these infamous slanders. To begin, it is essential to remember that Islam prohibits child marriage. In Shura and Nisa, verse 24, it is stated, Give them their daris as a duty indicating that one of the requirements for a marriage to be legitimate is that the man provides a dowry to the woman. Additionally, in verse 6 of the same surah and nisa, it mentions, Do not hand over to the weak-minded your property which Allah has assigned to you to manage, but feed and clothe them from it, and speak to them words of kindness. This emphasizes that the orphan's property must be safeguarded until they reach maturity and the capacity to manage it themselves. Regarding marriage, it is stated that the woman has the right to receive a dowry as financial security, 
while the orphan's property must be protected until they can manage it responsibly. This implies that child marriage is inappropriate, as children lack the capacity to manage their property or make mature decisions, further reinforcing the argument against such unions. Therefore, we can conclude that, according to the Quran and these guidelines on managing the property of orphans and the need for maturity, Islam opposes child marriage, as children are not in a position to manage their affairs properly. Additionally, Imam Bukhari, based on verse 33 of Surah and nur affirms that a forced marriage is not valid. Similarly, Bukhari narrates that a woman named Kansa was forced into marriage by her father, and when this matter reached the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, he declared the marriage invalid. These examples demonstrate that consent is an essential condition for a marriage to be valid. How can a child, who does not yet understand the meaning of marriage, give their consent? Even if they did, how could such consent be considered valid? By analyzing the Quran, we observe that it mentions free women, young wives, widows, and even women of Jewish and Christian origin, but never children. This indirectly demonstrates that Islam does not permit child marriage. Furthermore, if the Prophet, described by his companions as a living Quran, had married Aisha at the age of six, he would have been severely criticized, not only by his companions but also by the idolaters who sought any opportunity to discredit him. However, the records in prophetic biographies, history, and campaign accounts show that such an event never occurred, which is clear evidence that Aisha was not six years old at the time of her marriage. Secondly, it is known that in the society of that time, especially in Arabia during the period of ignorance, Jahilida, orphans, women, and girls were considered of little value. It was common practice for families to be ashamed of the birth of a daughter, and in some cases, a pit was prepared before birth to bury the newborn alive without bringing her home. During an era when some families defied this barbaric custom, Aisha was taken to Dar al-Madwa when she reached puberty to declare that she had become a young woman fit for marriage. This place, where administrative, religious, and social matters were discussed, served as the setting for a ceremony symbolizing that the girl had reached the necessary maturity for marriage. Following this line of reasoning, the claim that Aisha was married at the age of six might imply that she reached puberty at nine. Adding a nine-year puberty period to a six-year childhood would indicate that Aisha was 15 years old at the time of her marriage. Moreover, we find similar discrepancies regarding the ages of other female companions. For example, although most sources indicate that Asma bint Abi Bakr died at the age of 100, some claim that she died at 91. Similarly, Although more than 95% of sources state that Khadija was 40 years old when she married the Prophet, some believe she was 28. The variations in the estimation of Aisha's age can be explained by the difference in how time was counted at that time. While family members and loved ones often counted age from birth, society generally considered age from the maturity ceremony. Aisha herself narrated, I was a girl playing in Mecca when I was taken to the Prophet peace and blessings be upon him. In reality, the true meaning of their union will manifest on the Day of Judgment. The terror of Judgment Day is so formidable that it cannot be described, as mentioned in the Quran. Aisha's words allow us to estimate her age more accurately. She refers to verse 46 of Surah Al-Kamar, which was revealed all at once during the fourth year of prophecy in the house of Ibn al-Arkham. Based on this information, we can deduce that in 614, Aisha was a child of about six or seven years old playing in the streets of Mecca. The Prophet's marriage to Aisha took place about two years after the Hijra in Medina, suggesting that Aisha was born around 606 or 607, making her 17 or 18 years old at the time of her marriage in 624. If, as some claim, Aisha had been married at six, she would have been born in 618, but the verse she refers to was revealed in 614, before her birth. However, Aisha assures that she was a child when this verse was revealed. Additionally, we know with certainty that Asma, 
Aisha's sister, was born 15 years before the prophetic revelation and died at the age of 100 in the 73rd year of the Hydra. Aisha was born 10 years after asthma, indicating that she was born in 605 or 5 years before the prophecy. This would place Aisha at 17 years old at the time of the Hydra and about 18 or 19 years old at the time of her marriage, which occurred about 18 months later. This analysis provides a solid basis for determining Aisha's age before her marriage to the Prophet. Before her marriage to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, Aisha was engaged to Jubair ibn Mutim. After the public proclamation of Islam in 614, Jubair's mother broke the engagement for fear that Aisha might influence her son to embrace Islam. From these elements, we can confidently conclude that the Prophet did not marry Aisha when she was six years old. First of all, Aisha was already old enough to be engaged long before 624, if we consider that her engagement took place when she was around eight or nine years old, this would indicate that she was 18 or 19 years old when she married the Prophet. Secondly, in the Arabic language, different terms are used to describe people according to their stage of life. For example, a newborn is called Sabi until weaning, then Tifel until adolescence, Fata for an adolescent, and also for a young woman who has reached puberty, Rajol for men between 40 and 50 years old, and Sheikh for those aged 50 to 60 years. When Jubair's mother spoke to Abu Bakr, she referred to Aisha as Jarita, which indicates that she was a young woman who had recently reached puberty. If we accept that she reached puberty at 9, this would imply that she was born around 605, confirming that she was between 18 and 19 years old at the time of her marriage to the Prophet. Thirdly, the fact that Jubair's mother feared that Aisha might influence her son to become Muslim shows that Aisha was already of sufficient age and maturity to influence the decisions of others. This evidence convincingly refutes the claim that Aisha was married at six years old. If Aisha had married the Prophet at that age, she would have been born in 618, which contradicts the consensus of historical sources that maintain that Aisha was one of the first to embrace Islam after Uthman Ibnafan and other companions like Abd al-Rahman ibn Auf. This indicates that Aisha was alive and mature enough to choose her faith in 610 when she became Muslim. Therefore, she must have been at least five or six years old in 610, placing her at 18 or 19 years old at the time of her marriage. Omar, who embraced Islam in 616, was the 40th to do so. After his conversion, some companions said, O oh Allah, honor Islam through Omar. This shows that the Muslim community grew and only influential figures joined its ranks reinforcing the idea that Aisha was one of the first Muslims and not a child at the time of her marriage. When she heard this, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, responded firmly, no one exalts Islam. It is Islam that grants honor to people. The messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, had prayed, O oh Allah, honor Omar through Islam. We must understand that those who claim that Aisha married at six years old are mistaken. According to such a claim, she would have been born in 618, but could a girl of that age understand and criticize complex conversations? It is unlikely. To be able to understand and analyze dialogues at that age, she would have had to be at least eight years old, placing her age at 18 or 19 years old at the time of her marriage to the Prophet. Peace and blessings be upon him. Although the exact date of Aisha's birth is unclear, once she married the Prophet, she became the mother of the believers. All these events were documented, so we know with precision how long she was married to the Prophet, the date of her death, and her age at that time. Historical information clearly shows that Aisha was not married at six years old. Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, remained married to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, for nine years and died at the age of 74 on the 17th of Ramadan, in the 58th year of the Hydra. Based on this data, Aisha was 26 years old when the Prophet died and lived another 48 years as a widow. 
Since she was married to the Prophet for nine years, it is logical to conclude that she was between 17 and 18 years old at the time of her marriage. Two years after the death of his brother's wife, Khadija, the Prophet's wet nurse asked if he wished to remarry to receive help with the children and household chores. The Prophet asked, Is there someone suitable for me? Then, Aisha, daughter of Abu Bakr, was proposed among the young virgins, and Sada bint Zama among the widows. Although the Prophet married Sada, this conversation shows that, at that time, three years before her marriage to the Prophet, Aisha was already seen as a young woman of appropriate age and maturity for marriage. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, did not allow young people under 15 years of age to participate in the Battle of Uad. Even companions like Abdullah ibn Omar and Rafi ibn Khadij were rejected for being too young. If Aisha had been six years old at her marriage, she would have been ten years old at the Battle of Uad. However, Anas bin Malik reports that she participated in the battle by bringing water to the wounded, which shows that she was considerably older than what some versions claim. Other clues reinforce this perspective, such as the fact that Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was five years older than Fatima or her account of significant events in Mecca, especially her memory of the two survivors of the elephant incident. Moreover, her memory of the prayer, which initially consisted of two units, suggests that she was at least 18 or 19 years old at the time of her marriage to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and not six years old, as some claim. In conclusion, we have presented clear evidence that the accusations against our Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, are nothing more than unfounded slanders. Some might object that in our current society, a 55-year-old man marrying an 18-year-old woman would not be well seen due to the age difference. To this objection, we respond that each era must be evaluated within the context of its own social realities. Nowadays, the average age for marriage is around 30 years. It is evident that we cannot apply contemporary standards to past eras. It is not even necessary to go back 1400 years. Just a century ago, in England, it was legal to marry at the age of seven. In France, marriage processes could begin at the age of six. In most European countries, teenage marriage was common until recently. Even today, in many countries, marriages still occur at young ages. To illustrate the social acceptance of such marriages in the past, we can cite one of England's most renowned writers, Shakespeare. For example, in his most famous work, Romeo and Juliet. Juliet is 13 years old, and her mother is only 26. Similarly, in Guth's Faust, the young girl the doctor falls in love with is 13 years old. These works were widely accepted in their time without being subject to criticism. These unfounded accusations against our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, were never directed towards him before the 19th century. It was only in that century that some Western Orientalists began spreading such slanders in an attempt to discredit him. However, 1400 years ago, the polytheists, hypocrites, Jews, and Christians of that time launched all sorts of accusations against our prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. They call him a soothsayer, magician, madman, sorcerer, and possessed, but they never accused him of being a liar or immoral. Even figures like Abu Jal, Abu Lahab, and Walid bin Mukira, who sought to discredit the Prophet from any possible angle, could not do so in this aspect. At that time, the age difference was not a cause for criticism, as it was not perceived as something out of the ordinary. If we examine this issue logically, this is enough to prove that his character was irreproachable. Moreover, by Allah's wisdom, our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, was endowed with exceptional intelligence, a prodigious memory, outstanding eloquence in Arabic, and many other qualities, and she was destined to become the Prophet's wife. Peace and blessings be upon him. After their marriage, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, became a key figure in preserving and transmitting the teachings of Islam. Her role was crucial in illuminating intimate matters that even the Prophet's companions did not know. 
As one of the greatest authorities in Hadith and Islamic jurisprudence among the companions, she transmitted 2,210 Hadiths and was recognized as the most learned among women and the most eloquent speaker. After the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, she played a fundamental role in teaching and preserving the religion. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, even said, take half of your religion from Humera. This shows that Aisha's marriage to the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, was imbued with divine wisdom and had a profound impact on the transmission and protection of Islam. Thanks to her teachings and knowledge, she trained hundreds of scholars. This demonstrates that this union was not only appropriate but also crucial for the Muslim community. Whoever contributes to a good deed in the name of Allah will receive a share of the reward, and whoever participates in a bad deed will have their share of the sin. Allah observes all our actions and will reward each one according to their deeds. Therefore, I encourage you to subscribe to support us in our mission to reach a wider audience, including those who are not yet Muslims and who, with Allah's will, may find inspiration in our content to embrace Islam. Remember that whoever facilitates a good deed shares in the reward of those who achieve good through it. If I have made any mistakes in my words, I apologize. Any mistake is mine and does not represent Islam or the words of Allah. I hope to see you again very soon in a future video. Until then, may Allah protect you and keep you in his care.